Good morning. It's almost Thanksgiving. So what are we thankful for? Well, we're going to be thankful or you'll be thankful that I back this thing up a little bit. Hey, what are we thankful for? You know, we should be thankful for everything. And, and you say, well, even the bad stuff. And, you know, sometimes especially the bad stuff. And you say, well, how would you be thankful or why would you be thankful? over something that was bad. Well, a lot of times out of bad things, God is showing us something or teaching us something and it's helping us to progress to the different, you know, another level. Uh, Karen Midkiff, good to see you. Happy Thanksgiving to you and Jerry. Uh, <clears throat> just getting started. Uh, actually, I was a minute, actually two minutes late there. I was not paying attention. Um, but we're talking this morning, uh, we're going to get into the book of Matthew. We're going to start talking about Jesus uh, because that's what we're thankful for, folks. You can be thankful for turkey and dressing and family and all these other things. But the thing that's going to make the most difference in your life is being thankful and recognizing what Jesus has done for you. And uh, we, we, as we think about the scripture, we think about Jesus teaching us to pray as we covered that a few days ago in Matthew 6, 9 you're going to quickly figure this thing out. And that is that, you know, being thankful is probably one of the cornerstones of being a Christian in general. So good morning, Biff. Good morning, Maureen. Good to see you guys. Happy Thanksgiving to you. Uh, I don't think we can talk about Thanksgiving and thankfulness unless we talk about Jesus and unless we talk about the fact that you know, Jesus came into a world that was an ugly place. You know, sometimes we're, we look at places or, you know, we look back at history and we say, oh, it was the good old days. Well, you know, it really wasn't good then either, you know. And, and as we looked yesterday, as we talked about people throughout history, you know, we think of Noah as being a spiritual hero of the Bible according to Hebrews chapter 11, and he was, right? But Noah's life wasn't easy. We think about Joseph and how he got to be the number two man in Egypt, which was the power of the world at the time. But Joseph life, Joseph's life was not easy. And we're going to get into this with Mary, mother of Jesus, this morning here in Matthew. And we're going to find out that, guess what? Mary's life was not easy. So I think sometimes we've got this thing where, as Christians, we're witnessing to people. And we're telling them they need Jesus, but but we're, we're telling them, we're giving them a false narrative, if you will. And what I mean by a false narrative is we're telling people that, look, you know, you get saved and your life is going to be a bed of roses. That's really never been said of Christians. Jesus told his inner, inner 12, he said, they've hated me. They're going to hate you and they're going to kill me and they may kill you. And then if you go back and look at the 12, uh, take out Judas, who was the devil, even though Judas kills himself, I guess. But you look at these people, they lived horrendous lives. They were hunted and they ran and they, you know, people chased them and people killed them and, and, and crucified them. And, you know, there's just all kinds of things. So for you and I to sit here in the United States of America today, even with its problems, even with all the craziness that the news media uh, is slinging around. And once again, why is the news media uh, sl slinging stuff like they are? Well, the devil is the principality and the power of the air. How do we get our signals? Generally, don't they come through the air, right? Don't they come through the cable and the, and the different things? So once again, it's not so much, well, I guess there still is a lot of satellite, but you know, the devil has been in control of the things of the world since sin entered into the world. Because, see, God created man, Adam and Eve. He wanted a relationship, but man rejected it. So God sort of started pulling back that day, right? Because why did he pull back? He pulled back because when sin entered into the world, God can't be around that. And so God said, you know, we, we're going to send somebody in a few thousand years and he'll reconcile people back to me. But for right now... We just got to go with this other part of the plan and what this part of it is to give you Genesis, then to give you Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 sons, to set this thing up as, as the Jewish state being my chosen people. And then we'll come back to this time in history, which we're going to start talking about, which is Jesus Christ. So I'm not discouraging you from getting saved. What I'm trying to do is paint the picture that you need to be saved because 
no matter what your problems are, the eternity of it all is we're going to go to heaven one day and this is not going to matter. And the preacher preached a real good message at our church about this Sunday. And it all deals with the fact, you know, we worry and worry and worry. And then when the time comes, boom, it just passes right on by us. Right? How many times have we worried and worried? And then when it came, it just, it wasn't nothing. See, we make a mountain out of a molehill so many times. But with Jesus, <clears throat> and I'm not saying we don't take... <clears throat> We don't take life serious, and I'm not saying that you don't get your feelings hurt, and I'm not saying that things don't happen, but in the grand scheme of things, nobody can hurt Brooke Lunsford, right? All my feelings could get hurt. Yeah, they could, but, I mean, it'd, be, it'd take a lot. You'd probably have to hurt my child or my wife to hurt my feelings nowadays, right? Probably the same for you. You hurt the kids, and then, then we're going to be on it, right? But I say all that to say this, we're, we look at Jesus, we get to a point in our life where we start to see the call coming from Jesus and we want to surrender. And what happens, I believe, a lot of cases, people think that I'm going to get saved and then J Jesus is going to correct every bad mistake I made for 30 years. And that's not exactly what's going to happen, okay? You got to live through those mistakes, but you can use those experiences to not repeat the history of those mistakes. So anyway, I'm going to go forward here um, in the book of Matthew today because the Messiah is coming. Who's the Messiah? That's the appointed man by God who's going to come and lead these people. Okay. I kind of looked that up because, you know, we hear the term, the Messiah is coming, the Messiah is coming. What does it mean? So let me just read it again. It says the one anointed by God and the empowered by God's spirit to deliver his people and establish his kingdom. So see, the one who's going to deliver the people was Jesus. And Jesus is going to come. Well, let me tell you something else. Jesus is still coming for people every day. And how does he come for you today? When, you're, when your heart's hurting or when you know he's trying to get your attention, that's when we need to surrender and get to the things of God. And that's what makes this thing work. And I want to read you something because a lot of times, we think of Matthew and we say, okay, well, Matthew was a tax collector. He was one of the apostles. But what about Mark, Luke, and John? Well, John was an apostle too. But Mark and Luke, uh, let me just read it to you here real quick so I don't miss it. It says, the gospel presents four portraits of Jesus, each in its own characteristic manner. Matthew was the Hebrew tax collector, so he writes for the Hebrew in mind, right? Those were the people that Jesus came unto because they were his own people and, and they rejected him, right? But but there's still the reach out to reach out to the Jewish people to let them know the Messiah has surely come. So here's Mark who writes the second gospel and Mark was a travel companion of Paul and Peter and he writes for the Roman mind. Why was it important to get a message to the Romans, right? They want to get this out to the Romans because the Romans were the power of the world at the time. And by getting it out to there, there was this saying that all roads lead to Rome. So here's the, the situation. The situation is real clear, okay, that Rome was the power of the universe. If you can get it, or the power of the, you know, known world. So if you can get this thing into the Roman people, it's going gonna, it's gonna to flow out and it's going to do great stuff. So the third one was Luke. Luke is a physician. Interestingly enough, he was a physician, and he's also a missionary, okay, that, that worked under or through Paul's ministry, right? So he writes with the Greek in mind. Now, who would be the Greeks? Well, the Greeks were the Greeks, but there's also everybody who's not a Jewish person was seeking knowledge, okay? We, you know, we seek to know, and we, we, we hear about Socrates, and we hear about Ptolemy, and we hear about all these great thinkers that came from Greek, uh, heritage, well, guess what? You know, here's the greatest Greek writer of all time, and his name was Luke, and he writes about Jesus. So just think about that. So the fourth gospel comes from John. Now, John's gospel is different than the other three gospels. It is an interpretation of the facts of Jesus' life rather than a presentation of its facts in a historical sequence. <coughs> Excuse me. So John 
when we get there, John was the beloved. He was in the inner circle with his brother James and Peter. And every time Jesus went somewhere where only those three could go, John was in that, was one of those three, right? So there's something going on. The other thing was, is Peter, when Jesus is about to ascend and you get over there near the end, it might be the end of Matthew. And Peter says, you know, tell us what's going to happen to each other of us and how are we going to go out of here? And I think Jesus did tell Peter, you know, um, you, you know, you will, Peter, you will grow to the point where you're going to give your life for me. And and Peter's like, there's, you know, there's this inner circle and there's this competition because they all wanted to know who was going to be the greatest among them, who was going to be the leader among them. And that's when Jesus brought up the point that the greatest among you is the one that's going to serve everybody else the most. So who served Jesus the most on earth? Possibly John, because at the cross, John says, John, behold thy mother. And I guess that was basically saying, John, take care of my mother from here on out, is, is kind of what you know the scholars and the Bible writers uh, are, are, are saying that that meant. So John did serve Jesus, and he lived the longest, and he's been poisoned and, and boiled in oil and all kinds of things that happened to John. But at the end of the day, he's writing the book of Revelation, I hear, exiled on this island of Patmos. So, and this is like 60, 50, 60 years after Jesus has gone. So John did live the longest. And once again, sometimes we look at our lives and we say, boy, he lived a long life. What a wonderful long life he lived. Well, you know, sometimes we forget the blessing of getting out of here as soon as possible. Surely our family is going to miss us. Surely we're going to miss some of the things of this world. But once you get an, a picture of what's going on in the presence of Jesus Christ, you're never going to think about this place again. And I really believe that a lot of us have got a real problem going on because nobody wants to go to heaven, okay? And, and that tells me either, number one, we're not reading enough about heaven. See, in my Father's house are many mansions, Jesus says in John chapter 14. So he says, in my Father's house are many mansions, so guess what? You need to get you one of those mansions. Oh, it's not a mansion. It don't mean a mansion. God knows what he means, okay? But he goes on even further, and he says, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And Jesus is saying, look, if it wasn't a mansion, I'd tell you. If it was just laying in the dirt instead of going to hell, it's still better than going to hell. Could we all raise our hand and say true? right? Because even laying in the dirt and going back to the dust that we came from is still better than burning and suffering in an eternal hell's fire. So Jesus could have said, hey, listen, believe in me. There's nothing extra I can promise you, but you will lay in the ground <clears throat> and go back to the dust. Because if you don't believe in me and you don't let me pay the sin debt for you, then you're going to die in your trespasses and in your sins, and then you have one choice, and that's suffering for all eternity. So think about that for a little bit. Okay, let's roll along here and see. I'm not going to bother you with what you probably know about the book of Matthew because I always like to pique your interest and want you to go and read it. But let's be honest, we pretty much have an idea of, of the baby Jesus being born in a manger. We pretty much have a concept of uh, the Holy Spirit coming up on Mary and saying, Mary, you know, blessed are thou among women. Here's what's going to happen to you. And Mary's like, wow, okay. And, you know, who could get all that in one message, right? But Mary says, whatever the Lord wants is what I want. So she becomes pregnant. And we see real quick that Joseph, as we talked about yesterday, Joseph's like, wait a second here. I haven't heard of what you're talking about. This has never happened before. And it takes an angel of the Lord appearing to Joseph in his sleep to get his attention. Now, <clears throat> that brings us to where, you know, I, I guess I jumped ahead a little bit. But what Matthew tries to establish right off the bat is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? Do you know what genealogy means? In this Bible, a book of faith, a book that we're supposed to just read it and believe it, they have actually documented the bloodline or the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So I don't know about you, 
But if I'm one of them people, or if I know somebody and they got to have proof, got to have proof, got to have proof, you with me? If they've got to have proof, then there's still proof in the Bible to go along with all the other things I can just take on faith. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. It's believing plus nothing else. That's what makes it beautiful. See, if I believe that Jesus is real, if I confess with my mouth that the Lord Jesus Christ is real, and I believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I can be saved. You can be saved, right? If you hear the word, see, you're hearing the word of God this morning. And if you believe on him that sent me, this is Jesus talking about this in John 5, 24. If you believe on him that sent Jesus, which is God in heaven, you shall not come into condemnation, but you're passed from death unto life. See, we're all born dead to God because we were all born with the sin nature that we inherited from mom and dad or Adam and Eve. So from the book of the generations of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now think about this for a second. So Jesus was part of the royal lineage or the, the Hebrew people from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But he also is through the genealogy and the line of David. Now, why is it important that Jesus is born in the, in the, the line of King David? Because God made a promise to David that your kingdom will never end. Well, guess what? When you put the Savior of the world and the King of kings and the Lord of lords uh, in your bloodline, guess what? This kingdom is never going to end. So I would caution us when we're reading about David and saying what a failure and what a this and what a that, that probably in this millennial kingdom when everything is set up, you're probably going to see David have a pretty high position. Okay? So from David, where do we go? I'm not going to read all these things. But from David, we get, um, he's through, the, through King Solomon, right? Uh, Boaz married Ruth. Remember the book of Ruth we talked about not too long ago. Well, Ruth is in the lineage of Jesus. Ruth was not a Jewish person, right? We go down here, and I don't know if it'll pop out at me, but if it does, I will read it to you. But um, the, the Rahab, I believe, it was Rahab that saved him at the, um, the, the spies, he had the spies. When uh, Joshua or Moses sent the spies out to look at the land, would have been Moses, I guess. So uh, she's in this bloodline, okay? Um, just trying to give you just a little bit more information here. So I guess what we're doing is we're setting this thing up. It comes all the way down to Joseph, who was the legal father of Jesus, although not... Um, you know, the, the, the literal father of Jesus. And then I guess if you go back and you trace it through Mary, uh, Mary, who is seldom mentioned in scripture, okay, she was also related uh, through King David down through that side. So I just thought that was kind of interesting stuff. So we know uh, about the scripture. We know that Joseph... Um, you know, at first he's reluctant, which any of us would be, right? We we think we're marrying a virgin. We show up and, uh, you know, all of a sudden she says, hey, listen, I'm pregnant. You know, we'd all be like, wait a second. We got a little bit of a problem here. So, Tony, good to see you this morning. Benita, where we're at is we just kind of went through the genealogy in chapter one of Matthew here, showing who Jesus was, showing how from Abraham, okay, all the way down through King David and all the way through 14 generations, uh, two or three different times. So now we're into this second chapter when the soothsayers and all the fortune tellers, and really it's all the devil, okay? The devil is telling people, you got to get out here. You got to kill these kids because, you know, the Savior's coming, the, the Messiah's coming, the anointed one, and somebody's got to kill this guy because it's going to upset the apple cart. You know, it's going to ruin my plan for, you know, for what's going on. So that's why this is going on. So when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Now, this is chapter two. If you've ever read about this, these wise men come to the king 
and they want to come and worship the, the king of the world and the savior of the world. Well, you know, of course, Herod is jealous of this, right? And not only is Herod jealous of this, Herod wants to sneak along behind these people and find where Jesus is, and then he's going to kill Jesus. Well, the, you know, he basically tells the Magi, he says, when you all find this Jesus, send message back to me because what I want to do is I want to come and I want to worship this, this same Jesus, okay? I want to worship this. I want to see who this King of Kings is. So anyway, after so many days, Herod realizes the Magi had tricked him and, and they're not coming back and they were wise uh, to Herod and Herod's plot as well. So Herod gets mad and he kills all the little children in Bethlehem, okay? And this is, once again, this is prefaced uh, back in uh, Rachel leaping, uh, weeping. I think it's in Jeremiah, maybe thirty-one fifteen, where uh, it talks about this is going to happen, that in, an, in, that in a try to kill Jesus, there's going to be a cruelty about the world where King Herod is going to kill all these innocent children. So is that heartbreaking as a mother and a father to have someone come in? I mean, you can't imagine that pain and that agony. So once again, it's 33 years after this before Jesus, or 30 years after this before Jesus starts his ministry. But do you think that maybe weighed on Jesus's heart and God's heart a little bit? The fact that somebody would be so cruel or that the devil is that cruel to kill a bunch of children had absolutely nothing in the world to do with this. And really just to show you the cruelty of it all, they couldn't have stopped God's plan anyway, and the devil knows that. So that's even more craziness that's uh, that's backed up or that's thrown out there. So lots of interesting plots and subplots here, if you will. So they flee into Egypt when they hear that, you know, arise, take the child, go, because Herod people are coming. You know, they're killing children and, you know, and once again, what is this what is this all about? Okay. It's all about the fact that evil is real in this world, okay? Um the uh, man that drove the car through the parade and killed innocent people the other night. Listen, there's got to be justice for this. And the other thing, and I'll just go ahead and throw it out there for you, people that thought that kid that was defending himself, where he was attacked by two or three people and he shot him people. If you thought he was guilty, you really need to have an examination on your head because, you know, that's, you're really missing out on, on the truth of society and the common sense that goes with a society that can sustain. See, we're in a situation where we've really lost focus. A lot of people have because of, you've lost it because of you don't like Trump or you've lost it because you don't like Biden or or you do or you don't like either one or whatever. But none of that matters. It's the truth of God that we got to get back to. So, you know, when a guy runs through a parade driving a vehicle and killing people and injuring all these other people, you know, the justice needs to be pretty swift on that because guess what that has a tendency to do? Stop other people from being stupid, right? Okay, that's, that's my point on that. So... Here's Jesus. Jesus is a boy, uh, you know, he, he's he's coming out of Egypt. Once again, another prophecy that's talked about how is the savior of the world that the Jewish people are looking for going to come out of Egypt? Well, it wasn't that he wasn't a Jewish boy because he was, but he had to flee into Egypt to get away from, um, from Herod's armies that were killing all the little boys. And it is Jeremiah 35, 15, where you can reference that. So, just like a lot of times in life, um, the uh, hair dies. God took him out, right, for what he did. Um, now they return to Nazareth, okay, Nazareth. And now there's a man named John the Baptist that shows up. And John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was the son of Zacharias and Elizabeth. And if you go to Sunday school, you're going to have this lesson probably. Uh, that's going to kind of echo or kind of be similar to Abraham and Sarah because, you know, Zechariah and Elizabeth had not been able to have a child. But basically what was happening is God was holding off because they needed John the Baptist, okay? And John the Baptist was going to be the one that says, I'm baptizing you with water, 
but there's one after me that's coming and I'm not worthy to baptize as he can baptize and because he's going to baptize you with the Spirit of God. And that's the beautiful thing about what your baptism is the moment that you get saved. Don't wait till the creeks un unfreeze to go get saved and baptized. You get saved and then the baptism is going to come because that's to show everybody else what's happened. Well, God knows what happened to your heart the moment that you surrender. So when I surrender, guess what happens? God sends that Holy Spirit to you immediately. All the promises of God, the promise of heaven, the promise of eternal life, the promise he'll never leave you or forsake you, comes the very moment you get saved. You don't have, a, you don't have another friend like Jesus. You don't have anybody that's ever given you all the benefits of the job the moment that you took the job. It'd be like going in and filling out a job application and them saying, hey, I'm going to give you $1,000 to go ahead and get you started this week. Ain't happening, right? So think about that. So here's John the Baptist. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. And he's saying, repent. Now, why is he saying repent? This is his big message. Repent is regret. And I can't believe I'm 54 years old and I finally, you know, a word just kind of pops out at me. But the idea is repent, which is change your mind. Change your mind, okay? Or regret what you've been. Regret the life decisions that you've made. Now, I can regret my life decisions and I can get saved and I can get where Jesus wants me to be, but I still have the consequences of all the things that I did in the past. Are you with me? See, this is very important to people because I think people really do get saved. But then they never develop as a Christian for the reason that what happens every single time is people are like, well, I got saved and I felt that excitement of Jesus, all that emotion. But after a couple of days, he didn't give me that new job. He didn't give me that new house. I mean, there's some people that go as far as divorcing their spouse and saying, you know, I'm starting my life over and I want to start with a new husband or a new wife. <laughs> that ain't what God, that's not what God saved you for. He saved you so that in your life, he could show everybody else how powerful he is by repairing your life. See, purpose number one is work on yourself. Well, I can't work on myself. You are correct. But the Holy Spirit is living inside of me. He can work on you. Are you with me? <clears throat> Excuse me. So here we go. Um, so as they saw John the Baptist, they saw another fulfillment of prophecy because they thought about the prophet uh, Elias uh, or Elijah and how the voice one of one crying in the wilderness, you know, he's telling them to repent. Well, guess what? So was Elijah a couple hundred years earlier so is he reincarnated or is he just the prophet that was spoken of in Isaiah? But nonetheless, it don't matter how and why, he's telling you that you need to regret the life that you're living and you need to see that the Messiah, which is God's appointed man, is going to come and he's going to make a way for you to have a new life in Jesus Christ and have eternal life when you leave this world. So it gets pretty good pretty quick, okay? So... Uh, See, as I said earlier, he said, I indeed baptize you with water, but one after me is coming uh, unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Now, fire, what does it do? Fire burns up. It consumes, doesn't it? So the fire that you're tried with, all the, the, the sin in your life, that Holy Spirit will start burning that sin away. And you say, well, what in the world? How? Because right now or before you're saved, you know, sin is a pretty appealing thing. But when you get to the point where you realize in John 3, 16, that God loves you, when you get to the point in your life where you realize that all of us are sinners and there's none of us any good, which are Romans 3, 10 and 3, 23, and then you see that God does have a way out of your sin in, in Romans 6, 23, there's a way out of this. Because I can't pay my sin debt. It was just too big, right? Because the wages of sin is death. So I would have had to pay my life 
to pay that debt, and then it only pays some of that debt, and then I go to hell to pay the rest of the debt. So when I read about there is a man coming, and he's going to baptize me with the Holy Spirit, meaning that everybody who believes, you see, he's going to put this thing in a position where he's going to get you ready for eternal life the very moment that you get saved. Wow. Man, where did time go today? Happy Thanksgiving to you. Listen, I don't care what's going on in your life. It's nothing in comparison with the fact that we're going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Man, I'm suffering right now, too. I got some things I wish weren't going on, but, you know, my family's healthy, right? Um, you know, yeah, I got to spend a couple hours with my brother today. I mean, you know, I can't help it. You know, once or twice a year, I got to do it, you know? I'm just kidding. But honestly, you're going through things. And I could tell each of y'all, there's things I know about you and things you know about my struggles. And we would be like, man, I didn't know that about Lonsford. And, I, and, and you say, well, I didn't know that about one of our people listening or whatever. But I know what you're going through. Now, do I know what you're going through to the extent I know how bad it hurts? I do not know, Right. But if I'd share some things with you, you might say, well, Lunsford, you're just a big sissy. You need to pick it up and go ahead. Because there's people on here this morning that are fighting bigger things than I'm fighting. But you know what? At the end of the day, what I've finally realized, and I've been through some crazy things in my life, it don't matter. Because like the preacher said Sunday, Jason Sammons at Salt Rock Community Church, if you get time, go back and, and read about it because it's a really great sermon on we worry and we worry and, you know, we have this anxiety about living and it don't matter. It don't matter. And, and one thing I read one time, it said they can't eat you, you know. So no matter how messed up things are in life or no matter what happens, you know, we're not out here in the wilds of Africa where a lion's going to come by and eat you, okay, because that's probably not the death any of us would have picked, right? But God's got this thing figured out. See, we, we, we're we not explaining it enough to people, right, number one. But number two, when God saves you, he saves you all the way. See, the Holy Spirit is a down payment on the things to come. One day, you and I will move like God moves. Well, if you remember the ascension, everybody's standing there, wow, look at Jesus. He's Man, he's flying. And the, and the angel of the Lord says, well, why are you standing there staring up at Jesus? And they're like, well, he's flying. And they're like, listen, the way he's going up is the way he's coming back. Well, in, the, in, in a day, someday, you're going to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and all the pain and the agony that you're feeling and all the things that are going on are going to be wiped away. Now, today, you say, well, if I just had $500, I'd feel better. <laughs> Absolutely. So would all of us, Right. Well, you know, if I had $1,000, well, if I had a new house, man, I'd just need a car. You know, we've all got things. And I used to think that, well, maybe I could, you know, give all this money and do all these things. And, and you know, all that is great to do. If you've got it, give it, right? But at the end of the day, there's another thing that's more powerful than giving something. Because if I give you something of mine, then I've given it to you and it's gone. And that's fine. But the prayers that this group right here, I mean, there's some wonderful people on here. Cousin Kirk, good to see you this morning. Myrtle, good to see you. Our prayers that we pray for each other are way more powerful than if I gave you the deed to my house. I could give it to you, but in 30 days, the bank would be saying, hey, Lunsford, did he tell you about the payment that goes with this thing, right? I could give you my car, but in 30 days, you know, the car payment people be like, hey, man, where's that payment, right? So Dave Ramsey, you know, the big financial guru, he's the one that says, you know, be careful how you manage your debt because you can become enslaved to the things of the world. And that's what's happened to a lot of us, you know. We're in a world where, man, they can't wait to fire you from your job. <laughs> they can't wait, you know, to, to boost you up, to knock you down. I mean, there's all kinds of things, you know, you, you need credit to be able to buy a house or to buy a car, but yet at the same time, if you have medical bills, ain't nobody can pay medical bills today. I don't care how good your health insurance is, your deductible's too high, 
that you, you just, it's just impossible. And nobody's even, see, with COVID and all this craziness, everybody's forgot about health care, right? But there ain't no way. There is no way you can pay because the insurance aspect, and I know a little bit about insurance from being in it for 34 years, the aspect of everybody paying in a little bit to pay the claims got thrown out the window with the Affordable Care Act because some people pay a premium, some don't. Some do this, some don't. Some got a credit, some got... So not everybody's paying in. So that's that's a different issue. But anyway, I don't know what all you're going through today, but I know what some of you are going through. And I can't help every one of you with something monetarily. And, and we've got this thing because of the world system and because of the economy and because of buying and getting stuff, because we've all got way more than we need, that we think money could solve our problems. And I'll be honest, I'm right there at the top of the list with saying, well, if I just had this many millions, I'd retire, right? We've all got that. But what the deal is, if I had millions or if I had enough to retire on, the first thing I'd probably do is I wouldn't have time for this. And you know God wants this done more than he wants anything else I do all day done. See, so we've got to really be careful. All right, we've got to get out of here. Happy Thanksgiving to you guys. Listen, we'll be on here in the morning, but I know many of you will be traveling. Many of you will be cooking, uh, but we're going to continue on. We, we just kind of got started in the book of Matthew. We may look at all the gospels, you know, maybe not every single sentence, but to give you the looks that what Matthew's trying to say, what Mark's trying to say, what Luke's trying to say, and then John, who is probably my favorite, um, because he just writes so much good stuff. Like when Jesus, he wrote down what Jesus said about in my father's house or many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. Folks, that's John chapter 14. Read those verses. Jesus not only saved you, but he said, I'm preparing a place for you. And it's not a tent in the wilderness. It's not you laying in the dirt. It's a place, it's a mansion, and God knows what a mansion is. He knows what a tent is, right? And he knows what you're going to get. And the Bible tells us that the eye has not seen, the ear hath not heard, nor has it entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Let's try to love the Lord because if I got my eyes on the Lord and I'm loving the Lord for all he's done for me, I'm going to treat people a whole lot better than I treat them, right? And I'm going to take a chance on doing something good for other folks. And I want you to do that very same thing today. All right, appreciate it. Yes, Miss Karen Midkiff, great to see you. And Jerry, God bless you guys, every single one of you. Man, I just, I'd just i stay on here. And, I mean, this is as close to a hug as we get right now, right? but we're going to be fine. We're going to find, they'll be hugging and they'll be rejoicing and they'll be us singing a song the angels can't sing in heaven someday. So don't get worried. Hang in there. Everything's going to be fine. Let's pray for our family, our friends, our enemies. Pray that last person gets saved. We don't want anybody to perish. God didn't want that either. But there is a last person. Let's get that last person saved. And let's get out of here to a place where the day will never end. Lord, thank you. We are thankful. We're thankful for it all. And if we're not thankful, slow us down, excuse me, for just a minute and help us to look around and just see just how great this place is, how great you are, Lord, how wonderful your plan is. And, and this Bible that you've given us, and, you know, as we're reading about it and, and how the Bible came to be and, you know, the people that wrote it. And, you know, we talk about sometimes the lost book of the Bible and we were reading about you know, some of the other writings that were made. And, you know, it, there could have been five verses here uh, on a notepad. And, and if it said, God loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you, Lord, that would have been all we need to know. And if we could have just known we were sinners, and if we could have just known that in your house were many mansions, uh, one of them's got our name on it. Man, we don't need 1,900 pages of a Bible to tell us that. Because you didn't tell us to prove it, you said to believe it. So Lord, help us to believe and believe and believe and help us to be thankful for all the things that you have given us, things we didn't deserve, that unmerited favor, that God's riches at Christ's expense, 
the grace that passes all understanding. You've given it all to us. Lord, again, we ask for you to be with our men and women all over the world, protecting us this holiday season and every day. Bless them in a mighty way. Keep them and protect them. Have them be faithful where they're at and their families back home to be faithful. Our policemen, our firefighters, and our first responders, our heroes here locally and domestically, we pray that you head up around them and you protect them. And Lord, we'd ask for you to push back with this Holy Spirit, this restraining power that the Holy Spirit has. Push back the evil as against the innocents. Push back the evil and give people an opportunity to come back to you. Convict the hearts because you're the only one that can save. Lord, we're thankful that the school year has, it's been uh, turbulent, but at the same time, it, it's really been pretty good in most areas of the country uh, as far as the COVID and different things go. But with the holidays, you know, hopefully the COVID will die back down. We ask for you to take COVID and Delta out of here. We ask for you to be at our hospitals, nursing homes, and the places where people are having to get in, in close proximity to others and they're having to help them and things and we pray that that COVID and Delta stays out of there. And Lord, we're just thankful for everything. The good, we're thankful for the bad. We're just thankful because none of this is going to matter in 500 years. None of this is going to matter in 100 years. Nothing on this earth can take us from your hand. And we're thankful for that. And we praise your power for that. Forgive us where we fail you. Lead us direct and guide our paths and we will not fail to always be praising you, praising you, praising you, and thanking you, thanking you, thanking you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, folks, get out there and just eat all the turkey that you can handle tomorrow, today, whenever you're having it. I guess I, I said tomorrow's Thanksgiving, but this is Tuesday, isn't it? So we've got a couple more days. But we'll be here. We'll try to be here every day we can be here. And we're going to continue on into this. Be thankful for Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, that taketh away the sins of the world is what John the Baptist is going to tell us. Rex, good to see you, buddy. I hope all is well with you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Folks, we win this thing. You say, well, it don't look like we're winning. Well, open that Bible and read a little bit. You know, if you believe on the Son of God, you have eternal life. Believing on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ will save you. Folks, listen, don't overcomplicate this thing because the devil loves it when you overcomplicate things. Recognize Jesus loves you. Recognize that I regret the life I live because I'm a sinner. Well, I'm a pretty good guy. Well, you may be a great guy, but you inherited a sin nature from Adam and Eve and everybody's got it. And the deal is all of us can be saved right now because we can feel Jesus knocking. In Revelation 3.23, 320 John wrote it down this way he said Jesus said this that he stands at the door and he's knocking hey let me in that heart let me in that heart and if you open that door turn that knob come on in here Jesus show me how I should act show me how it should be you'll come in there and I guarantee you you'll never be the same and all you'll be thinking from that moment forward is well I wish I'd have done this sooner have a great day. We appreciate you so much.